Welcome to the CFE Media and Technology Education Session. Control Theory, a Superior Paradigm over AI for Improving Plan Performance, sponsored by GE Digital. I'm your moderator, Mark T. Hosky, with CFE Media and Technology and Control Engineering. In keeping with our CEP policy, please take some time to read the Quality Assurance slide. This session is designed for those interested in looking at model predictive control and artificial intelligence control techniques. It also will look at when each should be used for perform performance improvements. Critical control functions will be examined, as well as where AI and machine learning perform poorly and why, along with related topics. Here is a list of the learning objectives for today's presentation. For a seamless online experience, here are some tips. Additional resources can be viewed and downloaded on the left side of the screen, below the session's agenda. If you'd like to take notes within the session, click on the left panel labeled Notes to do so. This session is available on demand if you'd need to come back at any time. Please remember that the live session will be followed by a question and answer session after the presentation ends. An industry expert will answer viewer questions live, and those questions and answers will be archived with the session. You can see the Q&A details in the Meetings tab on the left side of the screen. Here's some information about obtaining an approved PDH for today's session. Today's speaker is Dr. John F. Carrier, Senior Lecturer, Systems Dy System Dynamic Group, MIT Sloan School of Management. I'm your moderator, Mark T. Hosky, Content Manager, CFE Media and Technology and Control Engineering. Here's a bit more about John. He spent more than 25 years diagnosing and eliminating hidden factories in oil and gas, petrochemical, discrete manufacturing and research laboratory facilities, saving organizations, hundreds of millions of dollars, and reducing operating risks. He also works with companies to successfully integrate the technologies of the industrial Internet of Things into existing organizations, focusing on developing frontline leaders in the culture of improvement. His research focuses on the competitive advantages of synchronization of operations within supply chains. Dr. Carrier holds the Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering from the University of Michigan, a PhD in chemical engineering from MIT, and an MBA from Harvard Business School. Hello, thank you, Mark, for the introduction. And uh, thank you for joining me today to discuss control theory, a superior paradigm for over AI for improving plant performance. Why this session? Well, first, uh, artificial intelligence and its marketing has really taken over the industrial transformation mind space. Uh, it's essentially on everyone's mind in manufacturing. It's in all the trade journals uh, and also the promotional videos. However, artificial intelligence and machine learning have distinct limitations when applied to real, noisy, non-stationary processes. And of course, uh, what I mean by real, noisy, non-stationary processes are factory floors, operations, field work, things where we spend, uh, as control engineers, a great uh, deal of our time. Model Predictive Control, or MPC, provides a superior framework for designing, operating, and adapting real processes over the more limited artificial intelligence and machine learning approach. And that's what we're going to focus on today. And again, we're not saying that artificial intelligence and machine learning can't be useful. It's just a piece of the puzzle rather than the entire puzzle itself. And uh, we can use control theory and uh, specifically model predictive control to really understand uh, that puzzle in, in its full entirety. And finally, the control framework is intuitive for posing problems, even for non-control engineers. And uh, when I mean by uh, posing, that doesn't mean it's trivial to solve. It's simply trivial to pose. And what that allows us to do in organizations is provide decision guidance 
to managers, as well as control engineers, and even the people on the floor doing the work. We all can't be AI or control systems engineers, but we can understand the concepts that drives good decision making, and that can make uh, our lives easier as control engineers and also improve performance and reduce risk. So uh, to start us off, why are we so focused on looking at digital transformation and particularly artificial intelligence is um, there's a lot of effort and investment going on in industry currently, and uh, the returns on that investment aren't always that great. Here's some work from Boston Consulting Group. Only about 30% of digital transformation projects really return uh, the expected value on the investment. Uh, about 50% end up with a lot of worry and falling below their goals, and nearly a 30% actually fail. And the numbers are even worse for artificial intelligence, right? But there are some successes. So how can we uh, have better focus, get a higher percentage of wins with lower risk? And uh, so this is uh, today's agenda, I'm going to have a fast review of first the artificial intelligence and MPC frameworks. Then we're going to review the role of artificial intelligence in controlling operations and uh, how artificial intelligence really focuses on a model and a data set, right? Then uh, we're going to look at uh, control system theory, in particular model predictive control, as a superior framework for managing operations because it includes the system as well as the model and data set. And that's critical to getting full benefit and performance out of our investment. Finally, we'll end with a summary so that you can take some of these ideas back to your workspace and uh, share your control engineering knowledge with the wider organization. So first, let's take a look at the artificial intelligence. And uh, uh, really, it initiated with the concept to simulate the human brain or thinking. So you can see in the upper left, a diagram of a neural net, which is really a uh, computer simulation of how a brain is supposed to work. And uh, the basis of a neural net is having these uh, basically small little elements with many, many connections between them, neurons. And the good and challenging thing about that is, uh, though, especially in that blue layer, there's a hidden set of all these artificial neurons and fittable parameters, sometimes up to 70 layers. So even though you can get tremendous performance out of this complexity, actually understanding or explaining what's going on inside that model is very difficult. And that has serious uh, consequences when you're dealing with systems that change over time. And we're going to discuss that in a moment. And in summary, AI models are generally black boxes with large numbers of adjustable parameters and these hidden layers, right? And where artificial intelligence is trying to go to um, overcome this problem is this concept around explainable AI. And if you look at the uh, uh, square in the lower left-hand corner, you'll see that today we take some training data, sometimes very large sets of training data, we put it into this large neural net with uh, you know thousands and thousands of fittable parameters. It learns things through iteration, and then the user asks, uh, asks a task and gets back an answer. The challenge with that is if the user gets an answer, it it doesn't, the user doesn't understand, there's no way that that system currently can explain why it came out with that answer, right? So the, what's currently being examined is this concept called explainable AI, where by developing a new machine learning process, it'll be able to explain why it came to that decision. And I just like to make a note, this is under construction. This does not yet exist today, right? And it's not ready uh, for, uh, operating your plant in entirety. So perhaps artificial intelligence isn't the right framework, or maybe it's just a part of the full solution. Now, in contrast, let's look at the model predictive control. This framework's uh, more intuitive, and you can actually model it by thinking about riding a bike. And we're going to explain that a little bit more in the second half of this talk. But uh, the uh, model predictive control framework is something we use every day as humans, even if we're not always aware of it. And that can give us a common language for actually uh, operating complex systems. So let's look at the role of AI in controlling operations. Uh, first, it's always good with a new technology. 
Uh, start with the hype curve for Gartner. This is for artificial intelligence. And typically the hype curves show the technologies go through uh, roughly five phases uh, through their lifetime. Over time, the first step is there's the innovation trigger. A lot of excitement. We get the computer to play a tic-tac-toe or checkers, a relatively simple game. And then we move into this peak of inflated expectations where uh, we start to think of the full vision or potential if we could actually run our uh, operations using that same type of technology. Then reality meets the laboratory and we fall into this trough of disillusionment. This is when we find all the problems that reality brings to us that uh, uh, don't allow this technology to actually reach our dream or vision. And you can see most of the technologies in artificial intelligence are still coming into that trough of disillusionment. And you'll notice that uh, one of the key technologies, deep learning, uh, Gartner has put it right at the trough. And this is a 2022 data. After people who work in real systems have time to experiment with the technology and make adjustments, we start to see some understanding or the slope of enlightenment, and then it is adopted in our uh, uh, normal system. So we start in this plateau of actually seeing the technology deliver the value plateau of productivity. That's where computer vision is. And uh, it, that's not surprising because computer vision actually matches up really well with things that artificial intelligence does well. And uh, Gardner looks at the artificial intelligence in, in four uh, groups. We're gonna examine the first two, model-centric and data-centric AI. So let's take a look at those two. Uh, when uh, you think about an artificial intelligence system, it's really uh, based or broken into two pieces. You've got your code and you've got your data. The original uh, approach was uh, essentially now called model-centric AI. And that uh, essentially focused on uh, improving performance of artificial intelligence through adjusting the model and improving the code. And for those of you familiar with the Deep Blue chess program that uh, 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 by IBM that challenged Gary Kasparov, uh, as they ran those uh, models, they had many, many uh, experts always tinkering with the code. That's an example of model-centric AI. But now that we're moving uh, out of the uh, realm of experiments and demonstrations into actual use, uh, we're finding this need to move to data-centric AI, where you spend more time on getting good quality data, your inputs, Xs, and your outputs to improve the performance, rather than always trying to tinker with model structure. And uh, perhaps by now, some of this might sound familiar, like we study a lot of those concepts in control, particularly around having good clean data and also clearly understanding your inputs and outputs. And as we look at those two, comparing model-centric and data-centric AI, uh, we really, uh, again, focused on, we've got engineers in rooms focused on code. Uh, data comes in fixed, it's dirty, doesn't get cleaned up. And uh, you're trying to basically get around by filtering and then overfitting, which is uh, a real problem. So now to switch over to data-centric machine learning and AI, which is make sure we've got really good data and make sure it's labeled correctly. However, uh, that actually implies more about understanding your system than simply looking at data. So as you start to see, a lot of these artificial intelligence concepts are moving towards concepts that have been in the uh, control theory realm for uh, well over 50 years. And... Uh, Let's actually stop and look at where uh, machine learning, deep learning, and artificial intelligence actually have some very good performance. As we all know, it does an excellent job of recognizing uh, images, right? So uh, uh, in machine learning, the graph on the top, if we take several thousand photos of cars and a human being carefully labels what's a car, what's a truck, what's a bicycle, if that data is fed and, and used to train a neural net, you can use that uh, neural net to look at that photograph and categorize it as a car or not a car, right? And uh, deep learning is similar to machine learning, except we've actually eliminated the the, the, the human uh, who's categorizing the car for the computer and we expect the computer to learn that themselves. 
So while that has a uh, takes the human out of the loop and would seem to have some advantages, uh, the computer can learn everything on its own. This tends to get very sensitive to poor data. So uh, this is a, a foundational for machine learning in operations. And as you can see, a practical application is going to be a visual defect recognition in assembly lines. And, and as uh, we pointed out, it's uh, AI is excellent at image recognition. Uh, and the approach typically works like this. Uh, let's say we're trying to recognize a human being in a photo. We give the uh, system several thousand photos of positive examples of humans. We give the photograph of several negative, thousand negative samples, cars, street scenes, et cetera. And then we can either use a human for feature extraction or allow the computer to do it. And at the end, you'll see on the right, uh, the computer is able to uh, classify uh, between photographs and humans and non-humans uh, uh, by the red and the blue, right? And that's essentially... Uh, uh, the level at which this neural net works, and it can be very successful at that. And uh, it's seen uh, extremely rapid adoption in operations, particularly around uh, high-speed defect detection for quality in bounded domains. So here, uh, you can essentially see it detecting uh, cracks on a, on a bottle, bottling line. And this is uh, very superior to human beings because it can run at much higher speed it doesn't have fatigue like human beings do, and it's easy to come up with good, simple training data sets. The reason why that is the case is the environment doesn't change much in a bottling factory where you're looking for cracks, right? You're not actually asking it to memorize or be able to identify things in a general situation, just limited to a bottling line. So when you're in a, uh, when you're in a bounded domain, and you're doing visual recognition at high speed, this is an excellent tool. However, if you want to step out and start using some of these tools in a more general environment, let's actually take a look at what happens. So you can uh, uh, look at this photograph, and I believe we're looking at a rhesus monkey here, which none of us had trouble identifying. The neural net uh, that was trained to identify this monkey in the forest uh, basically uh, identified it with over 95% confidence and it, it uh, gave it a confidence level of a person of uh, 0.371% uh, or 37%, right? Now, if you put in uh, what's called an occluder in the photograph, say a motorcycle, a bicycle, or a guitar, that literally increases uh, the probability that the uh, algorithm thinks it's a human being from around 37% up to... Uh, 85% for the motorcycle. So small changes to the environment can actually really throw these systems off. And again, for those of us who've worked in systems and factories, we know that that environment is has open boundaries and it's changing day by day, if not minute by minute. So that was a visual uh, uh, detection example. Now I wanna show you an example around time series analysis predictions. So uh, one of the challenges you use model-centric approaches is they tend to, uh, uh, you're trying to overcome uh, prediction errors through uh, tinkering with the model, and that gets you into overfitting. So we're going to look at this example uh, uh, from Google Flu, uh, and the engineers at Google had a really good idea. Can we predict um, uh, basically the occurrence uh, of flu by looking at uh, what people type into their chat box. So if, if people start saying, you know, I, I'm sniffling, I got flu symptoms, et cetera, could that give you three to six weeks uh, extra notice that there was going to be a flu epidemic even before the CDC? So you'll notice uh, in this graph is around 2009, when we're just using training data, you'll see that the Google uh, algorithm in blue does an excellent job of fitting the CDC data. But around between 2009, 2010, you can see the uh, red CDC line start to deviate from the Google algorithm. And you can see that arrow is Google did an update to the algorithm. Okay. So they spent the next couple of years uh, doing, you know, training and starting to run the algorithm. And then in 2013, we had exactly the same problem where the Google uh, algorithm uh, based on deep learning 
actually was off by a factor of two compared to the CDC uh, measurements. And uh, again, the reason why this should not be shocking to us is when you have these complex models, uh, when you overfit data, especially time series data, it will give you false, false confidence and actually give you very poor predictive power, probably worse than uh, if you simply used a much simpler algorithm. And uh, one point of note, uh, one of the things that drove some of this poor performance is uh, the, the data they used, again, were uh, tags of people entering flu symptoms or do I have the flu into the uh, Google search engine. And they found out that people don't define flu the same way doctors or the CDC does. So even that uh, simple uh, concept around having proper definition of your variables can throw these systems off. Now, again, AI can produce some superior results. We know that back in 2017, uh, Google's DeepMind defeated the number one Go player, right? And it did it by basically playing millions of games against itself, right? Now, um, why this is interesting is, although it had to collect, uh, do all these simulations of itself, uh, Go is a relatively simple game. You know, it, it's, it's a board, it's got so many pieces, it's got so many squares, that never changes, right? So all these games that played millions of time, all of those are very, very clean data sets, right? And so, uh, again, AI works very well in these well-defined uh, environments, but it starts to break down when we start to get uh, against real-world complexity and noise. And uh, also, as impressive as some of these AI algorithms are, we should always keep in mind that the fundamentals are actually can be understood with simple examples. So instead of Go, let's consider the game of tic-tac-toe. Now, if uh, you actually sat down and did the analysis, tic-tac-toe has 255,000 unique games. However, if you include some expert domain knowledge, and this is all, uh, since I think we're all experts at tic-tac-toe, we're the domain experts, you realize that the corners and the edges, uh, there's some symmetry there. So there, all those solutions aren't uh, uh, really can be condensed into a smaller subset. So you only need to have to look at a few hundred games instead of 255,000. So, and we find this in practice is understanding domain, domain knowledge helps us narrow the potential uh, answer space. And that not only saves us a lot of time uh, in practice, it also makes it easier to explain to our, our colleagues at work when we need to get alignment and buy-in. And uh, one last uh, example from the uh, AI and its limitations. Here's another game that many of us may feel we're domain experts at. It's the game of breakout there on the left. And uh, in around 2000, in the 2010s to 15s, uh, the experts at Google Mind, DeepMind, decided to put their best AI engine to conquer breakout. And uh, essentially the algorithm behind it's very simple. Uh, this reinforcement learning essentially watches the game play and uh, it basically measures the points it scores per game and uses that as feedback. So it has a very simple uh, closed loop feedback training mechanism. And uh, however, through all these millions of simulations, they uh, it finally can beat any human. And uh, the DeepMind co-founder said the strategy, a strategy emerged that the computer discovered that no human could have come up with, right? Now that's debatable. My favorite strategy is to go up the side, right? Maybe that's yours. Um, but here's the interesting part and the point of this uh, slide is here's where the trouble starts. If you actually move the uh, paddle on the bottom, two or three pixels in any direction, uh, the, the uh, AI system completely breaks down. So all that investment of uh, the millions of games played and the uh, iterations to adjust the fittable parameters in the reinforcement learning algorithm basically uh, uh, completely fall apart with the smallest change to the game. And that really makes that a lot of these optimal artificial intelligence solutions to be brittle when we're asking them to do higher order processes. And uh, just to reemphasize the point, when you start looking at these deep neural nets, they're essentially data-driven, not model-driven. What I mean by that is 
uh, the good part is there's no assumption of what the model is. So therefore, uh, you eliminate the probability that, you know, maybe we picked the wrong model structure. However, as you can see on this graph in that green line, you don't get superior performance until you've collected, you know, uh, uh, hundreds to thousands of times the data you would need with a traditional machine learning technique where you actually assume a model structure. And while that's extremely useful for some environments, uh, for environments that are time variant, uh, by the time you've collected that much data, a lot of it is basically uh, uh, out of date and therefore the model is not so useful. And uh, actually, uh, sometimes the model free approach even has limitations of trying to recognize what's going on. It's particularly bad at recognizing um, uh, data that, that basically has discontinuous points in it. Here was... Uh, simply trying to estimate the logistics uh, equation. And uh, as you can see with uh, your red data points, that the neural net in green tries to fit those points exactly. So instead of actually fitting that smooth uh, logistics curve, it creates a, a very uh, bumpy uh, representation, which is actually probably poor representation, representation than simply the data itself. So you do need to be careful when you start applying these black box machine learning techniques uh, to uh, uh, unfamiliar and new areas. And I'm gonna wrap up this section on the uh, AI portion by looking at the work that Andrew Ng's done of Stanford. He's been a major proponent and has done some great work advancing artificial intelligence, right? And he's one of the leading speakers on it. This is a recent article he had in uh, MIT Technology Re uh, Review where he starts discussing the concept of, hey, let's forget about building these AI first businesses or companies. Let's start with a mission. The reason I like that is uh, since I teach in a business school, the mission for any company is not to run out of cash, right? Uh, otherwise, you don't have a company. So first, uh, when you try to migrate technology from a lab into a business, you have to make sure that you're always considering uh cash flow and productivity and return on investment when you make those investments. And uh, Andrew Wink starts uh, providing some typical questions you might ask when you're trying to apply artificial intelligence to these uh, to a factory, right? And in the first quote, he says, in a factory, should you pri prioritize upgrading the sensor from 10 times a second to 100 times? Well, that question sounds very much to what we uh, discussed in system identification and all the work back to Claude Shannon back in the 1950s and 50s and 60s. So uh, again, the real thing is start to expand and use knowledge from the greater world of control rather than limit yourself to AI. I also put the second quote in here because he notes uh, that when his team starts to do an AI project, they realize the system's missing feedback, right? And actually, uh, this team is actually discovering uh, a missing feedback loop. And that, again, is a control problem that doesn't necessarily take artificial intelligence to solve. And uh, uh, just to finalize on this point, uh, AI was built for 50 million data points. And that's not necessarily going to work when you only have 50. And when I heard that number, about 50, it makes me think of the way I normally work when I go into any new system. First thing I do, ask for the first 50 to 100 data points, and I make a classic Schuert's control chart. And the reason why that's so valuable is for two reasons. One, if the plant's time invariant, those 100 data points reflect the plant all the way to the distant past. If the plant basically changes over time, only the last 100 points are relevant. So uh, a lot of these uh, strategies where people collect massive amounts of operational data to store in a data lake before they analyze it are fundamentally flawed as well as expensive. And this simple approach of going back to our concept of stable systems using Schuert charts can save your company a lot of money and get your project started much quickly. Okay. And uh, one last uh, uh, interesting point on the model centric and data centric machine learning is on the left, the model centric is really focused on work, working on the code, optimizing the model, and it uh, basically assumes the data is correct. The data-centered cent machine learning 
uh, basically tries to focus first on getting quality data before you even start feeding it to an algorithm. And this has some very strong parallels to what's in the control engineer's toolbox, model identification and noise filtering. So we're starting to see that uh, as we push AI, we're getting back to our classic control concepts. And just to end, the research shows us, this is a, a just a survey data collected uh, this year, is uh, in terms of artificial intelligence use cases, AI is most effective in quality improvement, supplier visibility, and asset material tracking. All those things were doing visual recognitions in a uh, uh, controlled environment uh, with specific domain knowledge. You'll notice where it's the poorest at the bottom, closed loop process automation and digitized control. And the reason why that is, is because real systems uh, basically have changing boundaries, they have noise, and they can never be modeled perfectly. And uh, although there have been attempts to uh, bring some of this artificial intelligence, uh, particularly in terms of neural nets, to basically provide those uh, uh, models that could predict uh, time varying response, uh, it turns out that sticking with some of the traditional approaches for those models is generally a better way because of the uh, accuracy of the data requirement. Okay, so let's take a look at model predictive control as a superior framework for managing operations. And uh, before I jump into uh, uh, model predictive control, I want to show uh, uh, what I found to be a shocking revelation from Dave Thomas, who is um, one of the uh, uh, co-founders of the a Agile Manifesto, right? And uh, this is the, the group that in 2010 basically listed the, uh, the rules and guidelines of what makes up Agile. And uh, in this 2015 presentation, he does two things. One, he goes, we got to get agility back from the theorists. It's very simple. Find out where you are, take a small step towards your goal, and adjust your understanding based on what you've learned and repeat. And if you look at that, one, that's a very simple control loop. That's all it is. And it's a lot, it's very reminiscent of Euler's method, right? So now even agility has a control theoretic framework behind it. And second, uh, even more astounding, he actually uh, disparages his own creation of Agile and says PID control is actually a superior way to look at uh, uh, problem solving in the way organizations run. So some pretty good uh, evidence uh, from the Agile community that a control framework is extremely valuable when you're trying to manage operations. That even includes uh, software programmers as well as uh, factories and operations. Okay. So let's actually look at this M, uh, MPC framework and understand why it's so intuitive. And uh, the way I like to think about it is, uh, if you're trying to explain this uh, to your colleagues at work, first say, have you ever ridden a bicycle? Because if you're ridden a bicycle, uh, then uh, you've used all the concepts in NPC. So let's look at those. When you're riding a bicycle, do you have a prediction horizon? Are you looking down the road and, and uh, actually you know, map out where you're going to ride your path? The answer is yes. And then you ask, well, do you have a control horizon? Are you also thinking about how you're going to adjust the wheel uh, or the, uh, um, the bicycle handles uh, in order to follow that prediction horizon? Again, the answer is yes. And then third, uh, as you, uh, you're riding your bike, do you have any constraints? Uh, well, of course we have some constraints. Well, first, I can only turn the bicycle wheel so hard or else I'm going to flip myself off. So you've got some constraints on how far you want to turn the wheel. Uh, you also have some natural constraints on speed. You know that when you exceed a certain speed, it also uh, increases your danger and you start to speed past your prediction horizon. And then finally, I want to put in the concept of the model. So when you are steering a bike, you might not be aware of it, but in, you have a mind in your model, uh, when you turn the wheel this far, it's going to uh, amount in this much change in your path. So you actually have all these four concepts uh, in your mind when you're riding a bicycle. And you can also apply this to business when you're doing your quarterly or annual projection. What is our prediction horizon? What control steps are we going to take? And you can also add in receding horizon, which means every month or every quarter, 
we're going to revisit this and we're going to repeat it. And there is the MPC framework, both in terms of a bicycle and both in terms of standard accounting uh, types of processes used that major businesses use. Okay. Now that actually presents a very clear framework to understand the four elements of MPC. Now, optimizing it is not easy, right? That's the, not easy as all as you can get some very complex mathematical problems. But in business and in life, we're not always looking for the optimal. We're looking just to satisfy, just find us a good answer. And that's something we're actually quite capable of. Provided we are aware of our, our horizons, our constraints, and our models. Okay. And second, what's so good about model predictive control, unlike uh, what we see in uh, artificial intelligence, is uh, model predictive control took us away from this classical feedback uh, ad hoc system where we basically just put a negative feedback loop from the output, subtracted and gave it an error signal and moved into this work uh, pioneered by Professor Manfred Marari, um, where you have an explicit model shown in yellow within the control loop. And the reason why that's so valuable is if uh, now using that model uh, control, there's a specific design for that controller. So you solve the controller design problem. As we're going to discover, and this is for us real world practitioners, your model doesn't represent the process as you've seen, uh, can be seen in that dashed line. If uh, you and myself as real practitioners and not academics go out and simplify our plant, it not only becomes easy to model, it becomes more productive and more safe. So this idea of a good model is required for good feedback performance is built into both the IMC and MPC frameworks. And that gives uh, extra emphasis for why companies need to do, uh, companies who use continuous improvement, uh, basically have better uh, performance response to the market and fewer accidents than other companies. And finally, uh, just a key point from uh, Rosh Aspie's paper from 1970, every good regulator of a system must be a model of that system which means uh, in order to have a good control loop and have a good regulator, you have to have a good model of your system, which means you better have a good system. And uh, just as an example, this is a real example from my own uh, uh, files, is the model is not the system. I'm gonna show you, here's an example of bicycles. These bicycles were used by the maintenance team at a refinery, right? And you'll notice the actual bicycle is not the model of the bicycle. Two, the actual bicycle was not the bicycle we purchased, right? And what we learned out of that is, you know, this might seem like a trivial example. These bikes were used by the maintenance crews. And we learned that the maintenance crews only were spending four hours on the uh, on time on tools. And they were losing several hours traveling back and forth, paperwork, etc. So even these small elements are actually part of the system. So if you've modeled uh, uptime based on high quality maintenance, this picture says you're not getting it. You're only gonna see that uh, from a control system mind point going to see the facility. And finally, I don't wanna model that uncertainty. We wanna change it. So in this example, we cleaned up all the bicycles, got an extra hour time on tools. So we have a better system, a system that's easier to model and one that's safer with better performance. And this is where uh, the piece of the framework that AI leaves out that is included in control is uh, what I put together this diagram on the data, the model, and the process. When I talk with data scientists and uh, uh, various AI experts, they focus heavily on model and data sets. They never really talk about the process or system. There's a good reason for that. They start out with chess and checkers. They don't get to change the rules right? Those are fixed. That's the process, right? Or they're trying to recognize uh, human beings in, uh, walking out on the street, uh, uh, those types of learners. You can't change the street or paint, paint the sidewalk to reduce signal to noise. So they generally don't have access to improving the process, so they never do it, right? And uh, that is a uh, extreme advantage we have as control engineers. We can go out in the processor system and use the fact that um, uh, 
if we can't model it, we can't actually run a control loop. So let's improve the system, which drives model data and process in a virtual loop, right? And that's uh, basically where I spent a great time of uh, my life focusing on a facility. And I'd make a note that uh, many of you uh, may have realized that after you graduated school, you spent about 60% of your time with the control and instrument instrumentation engineers because getting clean data was the most important thing. And uh, that was not in my textbooks. So uh, just an example of how that learning actually may reflect in your real career. And just as you go back uh, to your organizations, make sure to stop and think how these concepts can be used to coordinate the activities in an organization uh, to first simplify the system, second, keep it maintained, and then third, Another control concept, let's keep adapting and improving the system, right? So that we uh, always keep improving performance while reducing risk. Uh, and just under the support about uh, the uh, care about over-investing and too much in technology and models is some uh, great work done by my uh, colleague, Richard Bratz at the, the MIT Chemical Engineering Department. And um, essentially they started out with uh, a set of data that was all generated uh, from a quartic uh, equation, which you can see here. And the question is, you know, what's the best model to select? The obvious selection will be a quartic, but maybe it's uh, a neural net could learn this, or maybe we should just use a simpler model. And the, uh, the uh, conclusion here is, if you uh, first take a look at the graph on the right, it uh, shows you the amount of noise versus the model performance. And as you'd expect, as you get to a noise level around zero, the um, quartic equation, which is exact, basically gives you nearly uh, perfect performance. It's a little bit off because it was done with 30 sample points. However, as you start to crank up the noise level, you'll start to see that the uh, uh, the quartic performance degrade, starts to degrade relatively quickly. And at a certain level, a simple quadratic actually performs better than the quartic. Why is that? Because it's not being pushed around by all this noise. And just another great point to emphasize is the quality of, of your modeling depends on the quality of your data. So you don't want to invest in your model if you have poor data. Also, if you focus on improving your system, right, making sure all your equipment behaves uh, to the way it was when it was designed and new, your data becomes less noisy, then your model becomes better and you get into this virtual loop that's we can only see by using this control framework. And uh, just uh, to show this in a, a general control problem framework, uh, I want to uh, point out the real benefit of using a input out map when you're actually designing new processes or discussing them with your colleagues. This might be an obvious concept control systems engineer, but a uh, quotation from my colleague Warren Powell at Princeton said, I find the most benefit has when I have just input output discussions and constraints with the teams. And it's important uh, uh, to help people understand the model is not the system. And what I'd like to do is to show you here is here's a um, let's say we want to model a distillation column. Uh, we have a model and uh, we have a set of inputs. Uh, that we define in that model set, and we have an output that we'd like to achieve. So uh, by using that model uh, and giving it an, uh, the desired output, which is Y, we can select the best uh, inputs for X, which uh, we see that's how you operate a distillation column, which tends to be uh, good equipment in clean shape. Uh, by the way, I must admit, this uh, photograph uh, I created on OpenAI uh, using artificial intelligence called Dolly. So I just want you to know, I, I do use uh, artificial intelligence where, where necessary. Here's where life gets interesting. When you try to control that system, it's not the model. So when you use your real inputs, uh, the real output you may get is not exactly what your model predicted. What you're seeing there on the right is uh, BP's Thunder Horse or uh, rig. And what happened was uh, they, uh, during a hurricane, they, they basically evacuated the entire vessel and turned on the automated control system. And what it's supposed to do is 
it's supposed to be 180 degrees out of phase with the waves. Well, unfortunately, um, the valves were put in backwards. So it was sending ballast uh, in the opposite direction it thought. So instead of actually re uh, mitigating the uh, uh, sinusoid amplitude, it was amplifying it. And they came within 30 minutes of, of scuttling basically a, what was a $5 billion rig that had only been used for 90 days. And that was because the system did not match the model. And uh, they, in order to get this into production, they skipped the tests. I'd also uh, like to say is um, in terms of why those valves were installed backwards, our first uh, assumption is, well, the contractors put it in wrong, right? And uh, it turns out that uh, the contractor stepped back and says, hey, you need to look at the blueprints. Those valves were, uh, uh, the, the blueprints actually have the val valves installed backwards. So again, just because you have a good data and model, if your system doesn't match, optimization can lead to destruction. Finally, I just want to talk a, a bit about human-centric models. Now, we uh, what I'm showing here is a very simple uh, model of what a neural net is. We take a, uh, a set of inputs, we put them into a mathematical function, lots of mathematical function, and it will give us an output, right? So, but that's in a very contained, well-designed world, like uh, a well-stated chess problem. But in real life, we have a different type of a formula. We have human beings and work done by Kurt uh, Lewin, who founded the uh, MIT Center for Group Dynamics uh, right after World War II. He came up with a similar formula to actually describe the behavior of systems with humans in them. And he says that behavior is a function of the people, which we know, but the system in which they find themselves, right? And um, if you put different people in the same system, their behavior will be relatively the same. The way we actually drive performance is by making improvements to the system, not by simply trying to model it using poor data. So I'd like to do is just uh, quickly wrap up from my, uh, uh, from my previous presentation. Uh, I discussed 10 key control concepts you can use to general organizations. Um, observability, right? Uh, and in this world of uh, uh, advanced sensors and measurements, we have much better observability into our factories and supply chains. Then can we actually control it, right? These are all classic control questions that uh, people without the background haven't asked. You can help them with that. How long does anything take? What's the lead time? That's your system time constant. Um, if your time constant to deliver a result is longer than uh, your, uh, your customer will wait for it, that system's unstable. That's tack time. Now we're starting to look at dynamic system response and time constants. Uh, inventory increases dead time. As control engineers, we all hate dead time. We You, you can only uh, uh, slow your system down to deal with it. Uh, when you bring inventory into a system, that increases the dead time. And uh, uh, we know it in operations as Little's Law. Most people in uh, uh, industry are always buffering themselves against uh, noise. They're actually slowing down the system. Uh, we talked about process model and data. I also want to say uh, in any system, you can have the possibility for inverse response. Uh, I've yet to see a neural net effectively learn an inverse response, and I would hate to imagine the amount of data it would take to do that. Finally, um, we got to remember, this isn't just a, a, a computer algorithm, sensors, actuator, and a physical piece of equipment. We also have people in our systems. And uh, if you think about Lewin's formula, uh, that gives us a Laplace table for actual people, right? Because we need to include them in our feedback loops as well. And then finally, you can always tell the help, uh, health of a system by how well it's synchronized versus its design. When you see these systems become desynchronized and slowed down, you and I know as control systems engineer that the time constants are slipping. We can go in and fix that. And that's something I can't imagine how you would learn something that quickly if you just shoved all that uh, data into a neural net and allowed the uh, uh, algorithm to learn uh, those rules of system dynamics and operations on its own. As an analogy, uh, many of your colleagues at work may have used this concept of the, the OODA loop, which was uh, John Boyd's uh, description on, on, on uh, describing how to have a uh, successful fighter uh, plane. 
and basically observation, having a clear, uh, uh, basically canopy with uh, uh, fewer uh, mechanical blockings allows you to see what's going on before your counterpart. Then you can move through the next three steps, orient yourself to the new observation, make a good decision because you've got good data from a good observation, then you can select the right action. And if you'll notice, all four of these together represent a feedback loop. And the time or the time constant, you get you get through that loop faster, uh, the more competitive you are versus uh, uh, your other competitors in the industry. One thing I find quite astounding, when you use a control framework, the pro Toyota production system has some uh, deeply profound control concepts built into it. If you're familiar with 5S, your uh, the control action is you're defining and protecting your system boundaries, right? The, uh, the concept of tack time, my system has to respond quickly enough to meet the needs of the customer. That's a ratio of time constants. The value stream is actually going on and measuring what the time constants are. Uh, when we study control, someone gives us those time constants. In real life, we've got to go get them. Work in process and Little's Law, we discussed this, is you can reduce system dead time by reducing the buffers if you can simplify the system. There's also the classic and on cord, which you can stop the line. That's fast negative feedback. When we detect a defect flowing down the line, that de uh, we can imp implement a very quick feedback loop using a human pulling this and on cord to stop the line. That's very, that is a classic control concept using a human as the actuator. And then finally, continuous improvement. At the end, this ends up being adaptive control. If we're always improving the system, uh, not only do we get better performance, but we understand it better. So it's easier to model and it's easier to filter out the bad data. So again, this virtual loop between the system slash process, the model and the data, uh, you can achieve amazing things that maybe without an AI, with using just the AI framework, you'd miss some of these concepts. Okay. And uh, finally, AI and ML approaches can be successfully applied in many industrial applications, uh, but they, uh, they're they highly focused on model and data. They ignore the real process, and they can be brittle with respect to noise. Control frameworks provide a much more comprehensive framework for safe and reliable operations. In particular, MPC, Model Predictive Control, it's a guide to entire plant operations and, and everyone in the system can have an intuitive grasp of those concepts, including your personnel. Finally, uh, rule number one, always keep simplifying your system because it makes everything else easier, right? Particularly in terms of clean data collection and modeling. And uh, finally, uh, managers understand control concepts better than AI. So it makes it easier to imply. So with that, I'd like to uh, 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 wrap up the uh, presentation. Just like to say is, I'm not against or averse to AI, but if you do understand the subdomains where it works well in the greater uh, MPC framework, uh, you will be able to have much better investments. You'll be able to select between people and machine operations better, and you'll just have a better and safer business. Thank you. Now it's time for the question and answer portion of the course. Please submit your questions using the Zoom question and answer interface. 